Did you know that there's a superfood that's so good for you? Many people in Spain and Italy take a shot of it every morning. Yep, it's true. The superfood I'm talking about is olive oil. Olive oil, and I'm talking about extra virgin olive oil specifically, is arguably the most nutrient-dense food you can put in your body. It's loaded with antioxidants and polyphenols. The superfood can help promote healthy cholesterol levels, regulate your blood pressure, strengthen your immune system, and actually feed your brain. In fact, it's so good for you, I tell my patients the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. But not all olive oil is equal, and today my guests and I are going to discuss why. In just a moment, I'll speak with the olive oil hunter T.J. Robinson. As the founder of the Fresh Pressed Olive Oil Club, T.J. imports flavorful premium olive oil from all over the world to the United States year-round. Today we'll discuss the health benefits of using olive oil and what you should look for when selecting an olive oil. We'll talk about easy and delicious ways to incorporate this nutrient powerhouse into your diet. TJ, welcome to the program. Thank you, thank you. So happy and honored to be here. Uh, you you're, know, I, uh, no, you're you're like the the my poster uh, user. Whenever whenever someone says to me, "Can I use too much olive oil?" I always say, "Dr. Gundry uses about a liter a week." <laughs> so I'm like, you're my poster boy user. Well, and I and I'm a big fan of your missives that you send out and. Uh, right. So, you know, you were a chef and a food journalist on your first tour to Sicily when your love affair with olive oil began. T tell me about sure. that experience. Sure, absolutely. So, yes, I was working and living in New York City, uh, working for a food network. And at that time, I had the opportunity to travel to Sicily right at harvest time. And I tasted something that changed my life, and that was fresh pressed olive oil. You know, being like most Americans, growing up not tasting fresh olive oil, uh, living around olives. I didn't live in California, where we only produce about, these days, about 5% of what we consume in the U.S. is produced in the U.S. The rest is all imported. So it was really my first time being there at the actual press, and it's kind of like the difference in like fresh pressed apple cider or fresh pressed OJ versus like canned concentrate or something like that that I was used to as an American. So it was a big epiphany to me, and, and of course I wanted to, being the chef I am, I love to share, uh, so I wanted to bring it home uh, to share it with my friends and family and fellow chefs, and anyway, it was a, a big moment for me. And I think, you know, it's interesting that this occurred in Sicily because I'm, I'm actually a huge fan of Sicilian olive oils. And I've actually adopted a grove in Sicily uh, for some of my own olive oil. And That's super we're, cool. And we're going we're gonna to get talking about that. Um, so a lot of people probably don't know that how the olives are grown, the soil conditions, the stress that the olives go through makes right. a difference, just like a great wine. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So you're going around the world to find this stuff. Uh, why don't you take me through that? What, what makes a great olive oil? Sure. So for me, freshness is, is definitely key. When you talk about health benefits and polyphenols and all the high levels of antioxidants that you want in a really healthy olive oil, something you really want to have in your as part of your healthy diet, um, you want to look for fresh oil, which means I follow the global harvest. So I'm one of those rare breeds that every quarter I travel, whether we're in the Mediterranean, which would mean Italy and Greece and Spain and Portugal and then I travel south of the equator for their season their fall which is opposite of the Mediterranean in our summertime uh, so I'm there in Chile and Argentina which Chile has beautiful fruit I mean the the climate the Mediterranean like climate zone in Chile is beautiful and then uh, my the, I'm just home actually if I have bags under my eyes you'll you'll know why I've got jet lag I'm just home from Australia uh, and uh, you know be, hanging out with the kangaroo 
breweries and the olive groves over there, where they also grow wonderful olive oil. So the freshness and following the seasonality, um, those polyphenols and, and healthy antioxidants, they decline rapidly over time. So about six months, they start to deteriorate after the pressing. So for me, you know, I'm on the global quest of freshness, uh, which is a high quality uh, indicator. Uh, of course, picking the fruit very green, that makes a great olive oil. So if an olive is green when it's harvested, it will have about 10% yield inside the fruit, 10% oil. If you let that same olive hang on the tree until it's completely black, you could get up to 30% olive oil. So unfortunately, the oil quality and the health benefits of the higher levels of oil are not there. Like you, it's a healthy fat, yes, but you're not getting the antioxidants, the polyphenols, all the plant sterols, then and, and you know all the health benefits you could be getting from a very early harvest oil. So that's why kind of like the Tuscans early on were very big. Like people would say a Tuscan style olive oil or the olive oil from Tuscany is the best because they had a tradition in Tuscany to pick the green, the very green fruit. They were one of the first people to do that uh, and harvest that very green, flavorful, antioxidant powerhouse. So uh, in general, I tend, uh, my palate goes toward that fresh green uh, powerhouse style of oils as you're used to, like in the trio, you know, that I send you. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's a good point. Now, sometimes in America, we see the words Nuvo Olio or Nuvo olive oil. Is, is that a sign that these were picked greener? It can be a sign. Usually it's a sign of freshness, but you know, I, I have some issues with that because sometimes they'll bottle it in clear bottles uh, you know, to show off its fancy color, which is great if you can consume it within the first few months of harvest. But unfortunately, with these, these some olive oils, people think like unfiltered and they look for really cloudy olive oil. And that can be good the first few months of harvest, after harvest. So first of all, always looking at harvest date. Uh, single estate farms. Um, but what happens is in an unfiltered oil, and, and if you lightly filter the oil or let it naturally settle before you bottle it, um, what can happen if there is sediment in the bottom of the bottle, that starts to ferment. So there's water in there, there's vegetable yeast, and that causes defects in the oil. So a high quality olive oil from a professional taster standpoint should have no defects in the oil to be considered extra virgin. It shouldn't be non-defective. So um, you would get those defects if the uh, if if all that was sediment was on the bottom and starting to ferment over time. But typically that is an early harvest style oil. That is a category. And you know some marketers have kind of latched on to that term. Uh, but it's not Novello uh, or Nuovo if it's nine months old and you know so you got to check your harvest date that's key i think that's a great point it's a point i i make in, in all my uh, podcasts and videos that you really need to see a harvest date on on the label and Absolutely. the other thing that i warn people is that the sell by date or use by date is uh, it's it's horrible number one Yes. Uh, I mean, tell me why that is. Sure, that's a super great question because really that is placed on there at the time of bottling, not the time of pressing, especially if you're buying from one of the big bottle bottlers, which has a lot of um, where they import a lot of different oils from a lot of different countries. And you can see on there when it says like sourced from and you see the initials of eight different countries how much micromanagement do they really have of that product? I mean, olives after all are a fruit, right? So we have to think of them like fresh fruit juice. Uh, yes, it unfortunately, yeah, it, it, it's based on a lot of times on bottle date, not on when the fruit was harvested or it was actually pressed. So yes, uh, it, yeah, it's best to always look for harvest date, you know, dark bottle, uh, single estate, those sort of tips uh, for sure. Yeah, I've been shocked even going into gourmet grocery stores or gourmet wine shops and seeing these 
what appear to be you know gorgeous expensive olive oils and in fact I was in one last weekend and you know I always pick up and look on the back <laughs> and many of these were pressed in 2015 and 2016 Whoa. and they're selling for 50 and 60 dollars a bottle and I'm going what the um, heck are these doing here in you know this oh. high class store yeah. yeah, that that is absolutely true. And it you know, Americans have been kind of tricked into buying like fancy bottles with nice cut glass and beautiful labels. And and honestly, you know, it it's tough, you know, it's really tough. The American, the big bottlers are, are doing a better job than they were. They're, they're transitioning away from the clear plastic bottles and over to at least tinted glass uh, light or tinted uh, plastic, the pet bottles. Uh, it does keep some of the light out. Uh, fluorescent lighting in grocery stores, not ideal for olive oil. Light destroys olive oil. So, um, you know, the big bottlers are trying to do better, uh, you know, and, and and, and are succeeding on some fronts and and there's a place in the olive oil market for everyone whether you're the everyday consumer or if you're really focused on your health and want to use olive oil as a conduit and, and backbone to your healthy lifestyle uh, which is where we fall we fall in that camp <laughs> so we want the best we can get our hands on so so you're all over the world I mean Give, give me a few of your greatest adventures. I mean, how do you find these individual producers? I mean, you get off the plane and you know, call Uber and say, hi, I want to find a great olive oil producer. I don't think so. Uh, no, no. Well, for me, it really starts with relationships. So I started in about 2004. 2005 uh, importing tasting and importing olive oil and I really started to educate my own palate and that's what I advocate for consumers to do today uh, is to really educate their palate so what I do um, I of course have my my producers my my let's say contenders who I work with who are let's say in Italy for example uh, up north I have the Prunetti family that I love a great Tuscan family I've worked with them for many years um, and if it's not a good year in Tuscany, I can go further south to, let's say, Calabria, and I can, you know, hang out with one of my families there, Labrandi, who has great fruit, great machinery, beautiful olives, uh, or I can move down to Sicily. Uh, and every year, that, that, and that's one of the issues that's important to bring up. It's not easy to just pick one producer and consistently purchase from that producer because olives are fruit, and every year, they are different so you can't it's really hard to have one grove that's very consistent high quality high polyphenol olive oil just because of the ebb and flow of uh, the fruit trees and how they produce in fact typically they, they produce much more one year and much less the next year so on the lower year they may be pushing the fruit uh, letting it get a little riper on the tree extracting it uh, pressing it at a little higher temperature to extract a little more oil because they're mortgage payments they don't change year to year <laughs> they're farmers after all right they're, they're farmers that's right so it's relationship building trust uh, having a stable of um, important uh, winners in important global competitions and olive oil. So, for example, there's a guide in Italy called Flos Oli, and Flos Oli has a uh, a guide. It's got about 400 producers around the world that are ranked, and every year they have a top 20. The flow, the coveted. Flo Sole, top 20. Um, and every year they, they choose 20 farms around the world who are the top scorers and, and represent certain categories that they have. And they invite them to Rome. It's kind of like winning an Oscar in, except in the olive oil world. Um, and there's this group called the Flo Sole Top 20. So I was at, actually, I think it was Paleo FX I was at, and I had on the table two of my most recent selections. I had my trio from Spain and Portugal, which had three beautiful oils in it that I sent out in March, and I had my Chilean selection, which I sent out in June to my club members. Um, and in that group alone, five of the six producers in those trios were Flo Sole top 20 winners. So I really, you know, work with the, the farmers who are 
already winning at a very and working at a very high level. And then I'm kind of like the chef who comes in and wants to make my own sauce because I think of olive oil as more like a sauce that Mother Nature made for me. So I come in and using different olive varieties, there are about 550 in Italy alone that have different flavor characteristics, polyphenol levels, spiciness, bitterness, fruitiness. I go in and I blend different olive varieties together to create a flavor profile. See in that trio you have in front of you, there's a mild, a medium, and a bold in every trio. And so what I try to do is create those flavor profiles and use the best of what they can get. You know, I may have them tweak the harvest a little bit or change you know, the pressing time uh, for more aromas and more flavor. So it's really, I totally geek out on it. So I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too much. <laughs> anyway, it's a lot of fun. Well, you're right, and I have uh, I did a little tasting myself uh, this morning, and you're right, there's definitely a, a mild, a heartier, and a more heartier. Tell me <laughs> sure. about, a lot of people, uh, obviously there's characteristics in olive oil, just like there's characteristics in wine, and it sounds like in, in, comparing wine industry, you're a negotiant. Uh, you're taking olives from different trees, from different producers, and making your blend. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I, I mostly, like 9.99% of the time, I work with one farm and one farmer to get their fruit. Uh, for example, in Italy, I may have to pull in some cousins who have some trees, uh, some family members, and someone who owns the community mill, uh, just because it's a, it's a small you know time operation. But these are very boutique artisanal oils that people serve you know to their family and friends. Most of these oils, are not exported and I think that relationship that I have built over time with the world's top producers allow me their best stuff um, it's kind of like me and my wife we love to have dinner parties and host dinner parties and we hardly ever invite uh, guests to our dinner parties that don't like food and wine uh, so it's kind of like my producers recognize that my you know, 15,000 club members, they're very passionate about their, their product and they're big appreciators and they get a lot of good feedback. So for them, it's like having, you know, 15,000 guests over that they can share their fresh oil. And when I say fresh, I actually fly it in by jet every quarter, uh, which is, you know, really sets the oil apart. And I'm a total control freak uh, about the olive all the way from the time it's plucked from the tree until it's in the bottle and shipped directly to someone's door. And if I could, if I I could hand carry it to all my members doors I definitely would but there's a, a lot of them out there um, you know so well, that's great okay so everybody yes, says oh come on olive oil is olive oil I'm just gonna go down and get the cheapest stuff why is that a mistake Yes. Well, you're not getting the health benefits of olive oil if you do that. You're a. You're getting you know a, a decent fat. Um, you know a good good decent fat source, right? Um, but you're not getting all the advantages of the antioxidants and polyphenols when you're looking at single estate harvest fresh oils. Uh, so yeah, and and you, it's a lack of control. So yes, it, unfortunately, the American consumer, uh, the vast majority of them don't see the high value of investing in their health. Uh, so they've had to create a, they, they let the olives hang on the tree longer, so you get more yield, uh, lower health qualities in that oil, uh, and that's sold at a cheaper price point. Uh, so it's really a bulk uh, buyer, bulk game. And like I said, there's room for everybody uh, in this market. Uh, you know, there, there's, uh, but it really, if you want the olive oil to be the backbone of your healthy cooking uh, like you said you know you just eat so you have something to put your olive oil on <laughs> like you know I, I'm wondering if you how you support your habit I, I know why you have so many great products and I'm a big big fan bless um, you bless you yeah <laughs> thank you well I know you have to you know ha you know ha have an income stream to support your olive oil habit because <laughs> you're not buying the, the junk you're, you're buying the small dark glass bottles uh, that you know you're not buying the big jugs so small dark glass containers that retains freshness um, and and really keeps your you know your olive oil in its best state 
Now, it's been said that America is the dumping ground for olive oil. Is, is that true or is that overstating the case? It's gotten a lot better in the last few years. Thank God. Um, really, it has gotten a lot better. Um, the big bulk producers and bottlers of the world have, you know, uh, UC Davis did a study. Um, it's been quite a few years ago now, uh, about a decade, where they pulled a lot of olive oil from the shelves of supermarkets in California in three different locations. And they tested the oils to be con to um, they tested the oil to see if it was extra virgin or not. And approximately 60, 70 percent of it was not extra virgin at all. Uh, so the 60 Minutes has done a great piece on olive oil and olive oil mafia and olive oil fraud in the last year or two. Yeah. Um, there, there's still some fraud that goes on in olive oil. Uh, the olive oil mafia and the agro mafia is real. They deal with it in Italy. We deal with it in the U.S. Um, you know, it, it, everyone's doing better, but there's still some ways to go, absolutely. All right, you brought up extra virgin olive oil. Or what the heck is extra virgin? <laughs> okay, so extra virgin is the highest category of olive oil that's contained, it's produced using solely mechanical means. So that means there's no heat involved, there's no chemicals involved. It's really the highest category. So it's got to have a very low level of acidity. And acidity in olive oil is not something you can taste. So people, you know, consumers can't really identify acidity. Um, what acidity tells you uh, when you're doing a chemistry panel is the quality level of the fruit. So it's all about the quality level of the fruit. So uh, were they picked immediately and taken to the mill immediately or did they sit around for 48 hours? Were they really ripe fruit and they were placed in the back of a dump truck? to produce bulk oil or were they placed in small crates and carried to the mill uh, were they left in the sun was there fly damage so all these things deteriorate the fruit and will uh, raise your acidity level so you want a very low uh, acidity level in the olive oil and to be extra virgin and honestly the extra virgin category is actually pretty wide like um, for example in my my oils are third party tested by a lab in Italy uh, and the to be considered uh, extra virgin, it needs to be 0.8% or less of acidity. So the lower acidity, the better. So for example, I'm just pulling up a couple of my, my recent labs. Um, mine were not even at the 0.2 level. So very, you know, very, very low acidity. So that's what you want to, you know, look for. And some bottlers who actually put that on the label if they're super quality, you know, minded. Um, and, you know, look look at sources like Flo Sole, look at national competitions, look at the California uh, olive oil competition that happens at the L.A. County Fair. Um, that Those are some good tips for identifying and, and just educating your palate and, and tasting olive oil and understanding what to look for uh, are the best things you can do. All right. So you've judged olive oil competitions. You've trained your palate. First yes. of all, how, you know, how does, so how does somebody taste an olive oil? And, sure. and looking at the acidity question, some people, when they have that pepper hit them in the back of the throat or they cough, some yes. people equate that with acidity, but that has nothing to do with acidity. That's, Not at all. That's polyphenol content, right? Yes, yes, yes. You're okay, so tell me how to taste an olive oil. Do you gargle sure. it? Uh, yeah, well, you can, but you're going to cough probably, especially my olive oil. So one, um, uh, so a Tuscan is funny. You mentioned that, that peppery pinch and that a Tuscan, uh, once I was tasting oil with the Tuscan family and they're like, oh, TJ, that's a two cough oil. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, oh, that's a, this is my early days. There's like in Tuscany, we say a one cough oil, a two cough oil or a three cough oil. I'm like, oh, okay, I get this. So this is what I'm supposed to be looking for. So I've been 
educated along the way uh, through, you know, over the years as well. But basically, when you take an olive oil, um, and, and I, I know you have some in front of you and you tasted some earlier today, I have a little, uh, I'm just for, for demo, I'm just going to use a wine glass because it's what I have handy. Um, and you can see this beautiful green color. And color is not necessarily an indicator of quality. Uh, as a professional taster, we taste in blue tasting cups. And these blue tasting cups actually disguise the color of the oil because uh. they don't want that to sway you, uh, sway your opinion on an oil. Because like I was saying, different varieties of olives have different levels of chlorophyll that end up in the oil and how it was pressed. So, of course, there are some people out there who cheat and add, you know, we're talking, you know, that's part of the the mafia, you know, what's been said, you know, many times over in, in media, mass media. But um, anyway, you take an olive oil and we place it in a small cup. Uh, usually it's a, a glass cup and you swirl it around and I put my hand under the oil and I'm doing that. And normally I would have about a tablespoon in the in my little tasting cup which is like a almost like a shot glass or a small glass candle holder um, but I'm warming up the oil so first step mm. It smells amazing, first of all. You want to smell the oil. That's step one. Uh, so you want to smell You want to smell fruitiness. You want to smell things like grassiness, arugula. You want to smell um, green banana. Uh, you may get things like artichoke. Like It should be like a bouquet of freshness. You should feel like you've been transported to an olive field. I'm going to stop you right there because there's yes, a producer please. in a little shop in downtown Nice, in Old Town Nice, who okay. makes an olive oil that tastes exactly like bananas. And I, <gasps> I didn't believe it, and I, I hunted him down. It's really hard to find. And really? he, he calls it banana olive oil, and it tastes That's and smells easy. just like a banana. So sorry That's to interrupt, but you're right. No, no, but I'm glad you say that because there is a particular variety that does have a lot of banana, green banana uh, characteristics is Arbequina. Yeah. It's a widely planted olive oil, especially in California yes. because it grows in hedgerows quite easily. It's really easy to harvest by machine so you can cut your production costs down and get it to the mill. It's a kind of a one trick pony, but it really is still a very, can make a very nice oil. So Arbequina has a lot of that banana, banana flavor, banana candy. So step one is assessing the nose. And like I was saying, like in this one, and you actually have this one in front of you too, it's the Alonzo estate uh, from Chile. It was harvested in, in mid-May when I was there and my club members had it in mid-June. Um, you know, that if you just open and smell, you yeah. can probably smell. It's got things like tomato leaf, um, definitely arugula, basil, like it. So yep. step one yep. is smelling the oil. Step two is taking a small sip of the oil. I would say about half a teaspoon and just letting it roll around on your palate because you want to assess one. You're going to notice, especially if it's fresh, high quality oil, you're going to notice bitterness. Mm. And two, you're going to notice that spicy pinch. And I may cough too, um, but um, that spicy pinch. So the bitterness tells you it's from very green fruit. So that's important characteristic. So fruitiness, bitterness. And the third thing we're looking for is spiciness. The spiciness tells you it's fresh. So that's the third element we're looking for. So that's how you assess the oil from the tasting standpoint. Uh, and that's really the best thing you can do. Uh, obviously, looking at harvest date, glass bottles, uh, stores with high turnover, not that wine shop you were at the other day selling fancy bottles. Um, and then you had another question. I think I've forgotten, but maybe it was related to the bitterness of oil. And yeah. Uh, so, you know, when I'm trying to get people to like olive oil when they've been using canola oil or peanut oil or you know that's right. corn oil god forbid well, yes. uh, and they go this stuff i, I it's too spicy Is, right how do you how do you transition people i mean for instance if I, sure. I hope a lot of people are watching us on video because that oil you have is really dark, dark green. 
And yeah, look at that. I mean, and it's yeah. almost black. And people yeah. go, well, that's not olive oil. You know, olive oil, it's, it's clear almost. Yeah. How, yeah. yeah. So how do you uh, how do you train somebody to to like this stuff? Sure. Is it like learning well, to drink black coffee? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's funny. You know, it, as you know, uh, first of all, transitioning from like a standard American diet. Yes, people. You know, you you've transitioned a lot of people away from that into a healthier lifestyle, um, and you know, incorporating more vegetables and that sort of thing. But uh, you know, one thing you can do is um, use the olive oil in things like vinaigrettes, where you don't necessarily taste the olive oil directly. Another way you could do it, well, you would taste it. It would, your salad would taste better with it, but it's not gonna immediately, you know, add that that flavor to your mouth. Um, the other thing you can do is um, pair it with foods that are inherently bitter, bitter and spicy already, such as uh, arugula, arugula or kale. Uh, you know, maybe on kale, something like that. So it's already got green. And I like to compare the difference between, let's say, store-bought olive oil and fresh-pressed olive oil as the difference between dried herbs and fresh herbs. So if you're a fan who of someone who loves the essential oil characters uh, and all the flavor punch that you get from fresh herbs, or if you're like, no, I don't like fresh herbs, I only use dried herbs. Yeah, dried herbs, you should probably stick to more of a ripe style olive oil, maybe that's a little you know lower quality, more cost effective. If you're a fan of fresh herbs and, and robust flavors, you want to go with a very early harvest, very green fruit, very very fresh olive oil. Yeah, I, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to, to talk with the, the minister of olive oil in, in Italy, and he, oh, cool. he makes a very good point. He said, there is absolutely no proof that oleic acid, which is the monounsaturated fat in olive oil, and right. olive oil is not just oleic acid, but it, it's the major uh, fat right. in olive oil. He says there's no proof that oleic acid is has any major benefit over over any other oil or monounsaturated fat. He said it's a carrier for the polyphenols and the antioxidants. And and he said That's we have so to understand right. that. And I I think that was a very important point. Um, there, yes. there's, there's nothing unique about this fat. Uh, right. It's what it's carrying to us. It, it's a carrier. And, you know, when you put high quality extra virgin olive oil uh, like like my oils on food, you actually uh, can your body accepts the new accepts the nutrients even even higher at a higher level. Um, you know, if you dr drizzle it. So when my wife and I, my wife's a great cook in, in our family. And when she sets a table with salt and pepper, the olive oil goes on the table at the same time because we're splashing it on the way some people would, you know, who eat ketchup, we would be drizzling it on our broccoli or our green beans or, you know, whatever, whatever, whether it's pork or whatever, you know, it's always drizzled with mother nature sauce. Right. Um, so for us, you know, we, we use it that way. Um, um, you know, to to I to I guess absorb more nutrient to get uh, more nutrient value of the foods we're already eating for their health value. You know, uh, that's a great point, and it's something I just absolutely first thing I tell my patients is, yeah, cook with olive oil, uh, but olive oil has to come to the table. And you're absolutely right; it's right next to the salt and pepper. And in, in any, you know, in any home in Italy, in any trattoria in Italy, they yes. bring the bottle to the table. And it's, That's right. it's the foods to deliver olive oil. Uh, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I don't decant mine into like a clear cruet where sunlight can get to it and things like that. Like I prefer to store it, you know, in the cabinet with my salt and pepper. We like a really clean, you know, clean area, more minimalist look in our home. So we keep things away. But when it's time to set the table, it's the same as putting silverware on the table. It, it comes out, you know, and that that's our habit. So I'm not a big fan of, you know, clear cruets and that sort of thing for, you know, and buying big jugs of 
of olive oil. You know, uh, oxygen uh, kills olive oil, light kills olive oil, and high temperature kills olive oil. Now, the nice thing you mentioned, you know, cooking with olive oil, and I think that's something we. That's should talk our next about. subject. Okay, good, good. So go ahead. You. All um, right. So we've actually had uh, a fat expert on our program. And one of the myths that is out there that I try to spell, and hopefully you'll join me on this, uh, olive oil, everybody says, well, heat damages olive oil because you can't cook with it because it smokes. And that's proof that it's damaged. Olive oil has a high, a low smoke point. It starts smoking fairly early, but it turns out it is the least oxidizable oil there is. It actually oxidizes less than coconut oil, which is kind of the gold wow. standard. Wow. Um, and so can you cook with olive oil? Absolutely. I walk into every Italian Spanish kitchen and that grandmother who's in her 90s is, you know, cooking everything, whether it's the, uh, you know, chicken parmesan or whether, you know, what, what she fries in it, she sautés in it, she roasts her peppers in it. Like there's nothing that they're not using olive oil for in the Mediterranean uh, and, and getting all the benefits of fresh oil there at least once a year, uh, even if you were to live in Italy. You would only have access to fresh oil once a year. So um, you can cook with olive oil. I would say that the higher level of antioxidants in the and polyphenol level in the oil to begin with actually protects the oil when you're cooking with it. So in my home, I love fried eggs for breakfast. So Megan will make uh, some fried eggs for me and she knows to cook my eggs over and she She's, like I said, a great cook, but she cooks my eggs over medium low heat and she does that in the fresh pressed olive oil. And honestly, I can't tell the difference between the fresh oil that was put in, was placed into the pan and what's on my plate after the fact that I, you know, cause I, we're pretty heavy users in our household like you, um, taking one from your playbook. And, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I, you know, it doesn't break down if you cook at a lower temperature and, and just respect like one tip would be, you know, don't heat the pan with the oil inside. Heat the pan on the stove, then add your oil, then add your other component. And that just keeps your oil from sitting there oxidizing and breaking down. So that's just one little, you know, takeaway tip. tip. Great yeah. tip. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, that with that tip, I think we're gonna we're gonna finish up. So sure. TJ, where can people find you and get more information about you and your work and your olive oil club? Oh, awesome. Well, I appreciate you asking. You know, obviously, I know your listeners are heavy users and you're really <laughs> good at, you know, teaching people the, the quality uh, olive oil is out there and, and, you know, how to get your hands on it. On a, So my job is part olive oil sommelier and part olive oil concierge. So not only do I sift through uh, the million out there to make my, you know, three, my curated trio every quarter, but then I concierge it right to your door every quarter, you know, flown in by air. So the best way for your listeners, I've set up a very special deal for them where they get their first bottle for $1. Um, it's part of my mission and the families I work with to get people educated educated on quality olive oil. Uh, so we want people to have that epiphany that I had in Sicily. And to do that, your listeners would need to go to getfresh36.com. Getfresh. 36.com and there they would pick up their one dollar bottle it'd be a full-size bottle uh, and they would be able to try that and then within usually about a month they get their first three bottles set uh, there's no obligation it's a one-time purchase uh, it, it's your trial for joining the club uh, you know I want you to try it love it be passionate about it and see the difference in your own health uh, your brain health your gut health and and all the other you know benefits fits that you could probably go days on days on about Dr. Gundry. Um, but anyway, it's getfresh36.com. So, uh, you know, many of our listeners, probably most of our listeners uh, are, are not uh, gourmet enough or may not have the means to uh, join your club, which is a great club. Sure. Uh, 
Give us some tips if we're going to Costco or the grocery store or Whole Foods. What do we look for? You want to look for harvest date number one. So harvest date's very important. So if there if that's not disclosed on the label, I would not purchase it. Purchase it. Uh, two, I would look for dark colored glass. Uh, that's essential uh, because light destroys olive oil. Uh, the next thing I would look for is a store with high turnover, like the wine shop you mentioned earlier. You know that that had oils that had you know were pressed back in '15. Mm, no. Uh, ideally, you want to consume an oil within one year of pressing uh if it's to be to be considered fresh pressed you would want it within about six months of pressing uh, that's kind of the ideal window buying in smaller containers uh, because the there's less oxygen getting to the oil looking for the words early harvest uh, and single estate maybe i've mentioned that one maybe i haven't but single estate is important because you know one producer has had their hands on that product and has managed it all the way through uh, there are some brands out there like california olive ranch uh, that does a pretty good job. A lot yeah, of I agree. Are, yeah. yeah, a lot of, a lot of, they're doing a good job with education. And there's some producers in California as well. If you're lucky enough to live there, go to your local farmers market, taste the oil, know your producer. Um, you know, uh, my my members obviously have me, and they they know I'm you know certifying their oil, and it's independently third party tested, and it's a relationship business. But start to build a relationship with your local farmer. Uh, there are some oil being pressed in Texas as well, from what I understand, Arizona, and maybe Florida, and a little in Georgia. So anyway, make it a weekend uh, around harvest time in October. Uh, go, uh, you know, go on an olive oil adventure and uh, yeah, educate your palate. Great. Okay. Um, let's, let's talk about another myth out there that the way to sure. test real olive oil is to put it in the refrigerator. Right. So there was a, a famous uh, TV MD that did a segment a while back that said, place your bottle of olive oil in the refrigerator to see if it solidifies. If it does not solidify, it is not extra virgin olive oil. Well, unfortunately, that has been debunked. <laughs> that is a myth. Uh, in fact, UC Davis did a special report on it. You know, this MD has a, a lot of influence out there. And of course, I got a lot of emails from my club members saying, I put my olive oil in the fridge. And I'm like, well, I've got my lab report right here that says, you know, it's the highest level in the world. And, you know, I've hand curated it, nurtured it from the tree all the way to your table. So I, I, I know every step that's happened to it, you know, in the last month and a half since it was hanging on the tree. Um, but yes, a refrigerator test is not accurate. It, you're not, you wouldn't be able to tell acidity levels just by refrigeration uh, or polyphenol level or anything like that. Um, yeah, it, it, it's not accurate. And there are other fats in olive oil besides oleic acid. Which yes, could, exactly. Yeah the waxes that are on the outside of the fruit and every olive fruit has different levels of waxiness on the outside and the you know the plant sterols and all the different you know levels and layers that you would see inside of a bottle of, of, of fresh oil so yeah it's not uh yeah not accurate shelf life of olive oil when should we use it up Sure. Uh, so really, if you're going with a high polyphenol olive oil, the the polyphenols themselves protect the olive oil from breaking down, not only when you're cooking with it, but when you're storing it. So if you look for early harvest, green fruit, low yield, usually a higher price point, obviously, because there's less oil inside the fruit when it's harvested and you have to pay the farmers more. Um, you, you want to um, you know, use that oil really within six months is considered fresh pressed and you really want to use it within about a year. Uh, obviously, the higher the polyphenol count is, it extends the shelf life. So if you were to open one of these bottles in front of you, Dr. Gundry, uh, let's say even a year and a half from now, they're still going to be pretty impressive and better than what you would find in most supermarkets at that time. But if you're in my house, this <laughs> bottle ought to be gone in about a week. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank God you're a heavy user. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us. And this has you're been great because uh, you know, 
every day is a great day to have some olive oil. Yes, sir. Thank all you. All right. I Thank you. It. And Thank now you. stay tuned because we are we got a couple questions. Okay. Oh, oh. Here's a question from the winning athlete on Instagram. I'm getting great results with your diet. Well, thank you. And I've been having hunger problems. I really want to suppress my hunger without eating meat because meat causes us to age. Could you please tell me how to suppress my hunger? Well, I think there's a lot of options for athletes without eating meat. Uh, obviously, I'm a huge fan of nuts, but I've had so many of my patients tell me that the plant-based protein powders, particularly like hemp or flaxseed or spirulina-based protein powders, really uh, fill you up. And that's not to promote mine because there are plenty of hemp-based, flaxseed-based, spirulina-based protein powders. Please be careful with most plant protein powders that are on the market because almost all of them have tested positive for glyphosate residue, that's Roundup residue. Even the organic ones have tested positive. So just buyer beware. Plus, most of the plant protein powders out there are either brown rice protein or pea protein, and those are absolute no-nos in the Plant Paradox program. So great question. Fill up on nuts or get yourself some flaxseed, spirulina, and or hemp seed protein. So that's all for today. Thanks for listening to the Dr. Gundry podcast. We'll see you next week.